Mm-hmm. Pip, did you do these graphics? They're really groovy. I use a third party tool, but I will I'll let you know all of my uh, e-learning secrets later. Mm. <laughs> as I shared with my the LEDs and graphics. Right, um, welcome. Thank you very much for attending the first ever Association for Learning Technologies. Uh, open mic event as part of the annual conference. Uh, the association itself, if you're not familiar with it, it's the leading sort of organization that supports learning technology across all sectors. Um, the conference itself will be in Manchester, but it's also very And as part of the social program, the open mic sits within that. There's also um, an ALT radio show taking place on Thursday night on the Thursday night show um, and a series of uh, learning technologists and associated professionals will be coming to that. That'll be fun. That's all online. So for today, um, uh, my name's Pip. Um, I work uh, in, in a learning technology capacity in higher education and also really enjoy, thoroughly enjoy the open mic format, whether it's online, offline. Um, and um, it's a really inclusive, accessible, interdisciplinary, fun, inclusive uh, way to share original work. Um, and this today is an opportunity for that. Uh, so just wanted to share the kind of plan. Um, so the set list, as you can see, we've got T, T, T Tiramini Nadan, um, Dr. Tiramini Nadan first, then Anna Somerset, then Wendy. Um, I'll be sharing um, a pre-recorded performance from, from her, which was created. Um, Hannah Maria Stanislaus, uh, Dr. Deborah Arnold, and then our um, a headline act, Dr. Lee Campbell. So I hope that's okay with everybody. So um, we've only got an hour, uh, and I don't want to stop you from having your, your dinner or your tea, whatever you like to do. Um, just a couple of reminders. Let's not do hate speech or any discriminatory uh, or prejudiced comments. Um, let's make sure that we support each other, use the chat. This is a safe space to be creative. I'm really looking forward to listening to your uh, creative work. If for whatever the tech doesn't, if for whatever reason the tech doesn't work, it's fine. <laughs> I'm equally as enthusiastic as I am critical about learning technology. And that's one of the things that I guess um, a conference is an opportunity to explore. So, without further ado, Tiramini, are you ready to rock and roll? Yeah, thanks, Pip. Would you like to share screen? Should I stop sharing so you can? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one moment. I'll just stop the share and the floor is yours. Oh. Can you see my screen as in full? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Pip. Um, so it seems I'm going first. So this poem, um, I want to do a bit of history around why I wrote it. I wrote it um, earlier this year. Um, I didn't present it. <laughs> Um, actually, it was after a series of online conferences being cancelled, getting cancelled because they were just waiting to organize it face to face. That's what people have been used to pre-pandemic. And somewhere there has been a rush, I think, for it because um, in obviously there was vaccination rates being high in some countries, which kind of influenced every other country to kind of end uh, their strategy towards the pandemic. And I also wrote it because of, so the title, You're Forgetting Me. Um, I'm just going to go straight into it. And then if I have time, I'm just going to explain about it a bit. So there you go, forget me not. When the world was crying in the pandemic, I was happy. Yes, I was happy. Yes, I was happy. I was happy that people were stuck at home. I was happy that the roads were quiet. I was happy that people had to Zoom and Google Meet. I was happy people were not turning their webcam on. I was happy conferences, meetings were all online. Oh, yes, I was happy education moved online. 
You see, or perhaps not, I'm stuck in bad bed. I'm autistic, I'm dyslectic, I'm an introvert, I'm immunodeficient. So few people bothered about me before the pandemic. I love COVID-19. It is so tiny, yet so powerful. It made this world halt. And suddenly, everyone was living what I have always been living. Now I'm scared. I'm scared seeing people without masks. I'm scared seeing people scuffling around. I'm scared that people will forget about me again. I'm scared that people will forget how I feel again. I'm scared that you will forget. Um, do I have time to for a bit of other information on this poem? Absolutely. Really have time, definitely. Um, I actually put it in a in a blog post that I'll share with you and all if, if they want to link to this. Um, it, it's a bit around, I, I've put a bit of reflection at the end of the post, which is I actually did a little heart here. It's half a heart <laughs> on both sides. And then there's forget me not with, which is truck through, which often when we work around discrimination, it's only like when we see it, then we think, oh, there is discrimination there. But then we forget that um, one of the things that I wrote uh, that I specified here is one of uh, the things that is many times misunderstood is that in the UK Equality Act, disability and equality is the ground that has uh, anticipatory duty. And um, my questions, because this is an alt pre-conference event, my questions would be to um, learning techs who will be watching this recording and even uh, people who are presenting today about what is your, I put A, B, D, E, I, J, which is in reference to equality, equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, access, justice, belonging, however you want to name it. What's the work you're doing at the moment? And um, what are these elements uh, in your, are there these elements in your current work? Are you questioning the status quo? And um, what does this mean to you? And I myself has an alt conference uh, presentation that I'm presenting on the 8th at 3.30, where I'm presenting on a skip your sleep. Um, it is 23.59, which has got to do with assessment deadlines and intersectionality. Um, Thank you for this. And I think, Pip, do I have time for the second one? Yeah, definitely. Go for it. Okay. So this one is actually a second time presentation. I presented it, I think it was um, World Creativity Day. Um, and uh, Pip organized uh, an open mic and um, I asked if I could present it again. So I'm just going to read it. And there is a recording again a pose with um, explanation. I notice, I notice the color of my skin. I notice the color of my hair. I notice the color of my eyes and whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I notice the shape of my body. I notice my disability. I notice my rasta hair and shush, shush, shush. I notice the tattoo on my face. I notice my burly figure. I notice my extreme piercing and act, act, act. I notice the rashes in my face. I notice my skin burns. I notice my patch eye and berk, berk, berk. I speak of how I feel. I speak of what I need. I speak with clarity. I notice. Whoosh, shush, ak, berk. Until I notice the color of my blood. Khuda jani ye surkha. Ye na kudume shadavanizvile. Uh, I've given a little explanation um, to that, but I'm just going to quickly say the last three lines, which is, um, as humans, we've all got uh, the same um, color of blood, but yet, you know, uh, the eye, the eyes notice all the physical uh, appearances, and that's where a lot of discrimination happens. And the one before last sentence is, Kuda jani yasukhan, which means it's red. And Yenna Kudumi Sarvanide is um, trying to find, <laughs> to find the English uh, meaning for this, but it kind of, of means um, like a face palm action, kind of, you know, what is this? Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm going to um, share my screen now. And...
have it on to Pip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dee. Um, I loved it the first time um, for the Creative Higher Education Open Mic. And also um, when you sent through the blogs, the blog posts that you wrote um, to explain the rationale of the poem, I really got into it at a deeper level. And I really liked that the idea of this, uh, the power of noticing. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and good luck for your presentation. Super, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen very quickly again. So thanks T. Um... <laughs> Someone's having a laugh. <laughs> right, okay. Um, moving on to the next part. Um, I'd like to invite Anna Somerset to um, to perform um, her piece. Um, Anna, would you like me to stop sharing screen? Or... Yes, please. Yes, could you? I'll share mine. So that's done. I'll just see if I can ensure that I'm um, in you. Where are you then? Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Brilliant. So I'm going to play something um, uh, just before I do my poem, uh, just to set the scene. Oh, oh dear. Well, it, oh dear. It's a sort of YouTube hyperlink. Control click. Oh dear, you can tell what a Luddite I am. Right, oh, it's coming. She's oh, got, got the advert, sorry. Oh, dear, sorry about this. Grammarly <laughs> makes editing one quick. <laughs> right, here we go. This is what I wanted you to see. Really old school. This is the technology I grew up with. <laughs> this is the highlight of my technology. <laughs> right, I'll uh, leave that now. Right, so it's called, um, oh gosh, how do I get rid of that? Right, so let's go back. It's called, before we played Pong, that was Pong, by the way. At the high-tech party, the game we played was Pong. They said it was like tennis, nor were they completely wrong. There was a bleeping and a weeping pain of failure even more prolonged. Before you played pro plong, prong, said Bomb, there was Leonardo da Vinci, an artistic technocrat extraordinaire, since he was just the painter of Lisa the Mo wasn't just the painter of Lisa the Mona, but designer of calculator, copter, and powering solar. Mum was not like Leonardo. Her etchings were just of people, but her, but her feature as a teacher was to inspire creativity and dexterity amongst young human creatures. Under Margaret Thatcher, bigger pictures came to play to overshadow mum's art room, craft, design and technology thrust into the fray. Mum was in her 50s and retraining was quite hard. Digesting, controlling things, artifacts and systems, her psyche got a bit scarred. Undaunted, she persisted and came across the great scientist and designer, Professor Heinz Wolf, who visited her school to inspire young girls to emulate this egghead prof. Indeed, some became designers of functioning gizmos and stuff, computer games, bleeping products, not just art to quaff. At 90, mum's a dreamer and dreams about her youth and her aging daughters just the same. But playing Pong will never feature in her slumbers, ain't that the flaming truth? 
And this is just a quick uh, video of Professor Heinz Wolf um, talking, who was a, a sort of real forerunner of, of technology teaching. So. If you give me just 30 oh, seconds, so sorry about that. how common <laughs> in went from making Oh dear, excruciating. Well, I am very concerned, and I have actually spoken to the chairman of university committees about this, that uh, by um, neglecting the fine manipulative um, work which our hands can do, <laughs> if you looked at the surface of our brain, you almost got a hand-sized impression of the cerebral cortex controls our fingers, that I believe, and so do other people, that there is a good correlation between manual dexterity and mental dexterity. If we neglect the practice of, of manual dexterity, we may well be taking a step backwards along the homo sapiens roots. And I'm really worried by this. Well, that's what he said. Anyway, back to uh, another poem. So that was um, Heinz Wolf speaking, who was a technological genius in his day. So this is my early experience um, with IT in the classroom, which was going back a long time. Right. Uh, as you can see, my right. So it's called Back to Basic. Basic, the binary language. And I were born in 64. When I started learning it in 76, it seemed a massive bore. The obese and ugly computer worshipped by the math tyrannosaur found communication with us an absolutely enormous chore. Sorry about this. Oh, you silly dexterous hands. So one nil, one nil, one nil. Nil one, nil one, nil one. Inspiration gone. Nil by brain and not love at all, not love all. And that's a picture of the bizarre binary language that we had to sort of put up with. So technology's come on a long way, but um, <laughs> that's my take as an old dinosaur. That was it. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, I'm sure we can all relate to that when it all goes wrong and you kind of goes and you feel like you're supposed to be really positive about it. <laughs> it ends up being the perfect thing that's not going right. And, um, um, retro games are really fun. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, Anna. No problem. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share screen again. Right. So next up, we've got Wendy Tellio. Um, so Wendy um, submitted a pre-recorded um, performance. Uh, Wendy is uh, working in learning technology. She's based in Australia. So due to the time differences, um, the pre-recorded option seemed to make sense. And um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a uh, PowerPoint slide, um, hopefully with some sound on her behalf. Sunset Shades by Wendy Tullio. As I stand drenched in the colours of the setting sun over the desert in Central Australia, I contemplate the miracle of technology that is bringing me to you right now. I'm inspired by the rich ephemeral colours of the setting sun to perform this monologue about my experiences as an educational technologist. In the practice of the bricoleur, I collect original material from the bird site, poetry and blog posts I've written. Nothing is original, right? The act of bricolage is to use what is at hand and create or bring something new into being. My work in edtech is often the work of the bricoleur, collecting the right information, having timely conversations and finding the material just a little bit faster than my audience. I've recently completed a site profiling survey. You know the sort. You feed in your like art scores and it spits out a neat little code, a quadrant, a title, a neat little box for you to fit in. This does not fit well with me. 
Can we learn from these boxes? Does it help me work with others if I know others are in the same box? In the years of working in ed tech, what I come to appreciate is the diverse nature of those in the same work. We come scattered yet entangled. Embracing technology as an entanglement in our work, just as I come to you over the airways, facilitated by the tech and always acknowledging the social materiality and the play space of the humans around it. Yes, that's the Tim Fawns reference right there. Talio, his internet moniker, is a colleague who I've never met but continue to meet through lines of sight. He lives on a different continent, but our experiences in the education field often collide. He recently highlighted a tweet from a HR executive that wrote about this type of profiling and whether it's necessary in the workplace. Talio wrote in his blog post predicated on why are we not enough. In return, I wrote this short poem. Poetry and blog posts often get lost in Twitter, like leaf litter mulching at the base of a large tree. I know not how, but the river of wind has blown this leaf to land at my door, lodged under the mat. I completed the survey, disc-like indeed. It bounces the harsh light of my faults back at me, with pretty solutions of what to do next time. Why am I not better than I am? Perhaps I am enough. Perhaps we are smart enough, human enough to play nicely or be the sharpening stone when the knife edge dulls. Can I be the promise of the rosebud? Why am I not better than I am? Part of the role of the educational technologist is to work with others to encourage the use of appropriate technology. This is often under the banner of the enhanced part of technology enhanced learning. Reference here to Sean Bain 2014 and her article, What's the Matter with Technology Enhanced Learning? In higher education, we are still in this, and I quote from her article, complex and often problematic constellation of social, technological and educational change. In this next poem, I entangle the aspects of the role of the educational technologist <clears throat> in facilitating change with the seemingly unchanging and hard nature of the physical materials that we use, keyboard, mouse and screen. Poems titled Change Driver. I am a change driver. I pick up the screwdriver, fitting it into the screw, work, 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 sharing my learnings, connecting with others, moving their journey along, along, along a path of building or repairing, deconstructing or making. Think, think, think of the future. We push towards the unknown, feeling the necessity, burning, burning, burning into our fingertips, onto the keys. Keyboards show no suffering, suffering, suffering. Just a few scratches, worn, smooth patches, our eyes glassed over, fatigue hits at the end, end, end of the day. As we prepare for another marvellous melting pot of learning technologists interacting at this conference, may we be able to see our colours, appreciate others for the unique contribution they bring to the table and continue to connect, collate and create inspiring work in our fields. Um, Wendy Talia, uh, monologue and poem from monologue to technologue, um, exploring their ideas about being a learning technologist, really powerful idea of entanglement um, and how to kind of navigate um, all of that. Um, when we work with learning technology, kind of perhaps we are entanglers and you know have to work with this complexity. So many thanks uh, to Wendy for her pre-recorded contribution. Okie dokie. 
I wonder if it's for me to um, invite Deborah to perform. Deborah, would you like me to share the um, sound cloud? Share the sound cloud link. <laughs> so, Dr. Deborah Arnold. Um, so, while we're waiting, I'll just put the, the link to uh, Wendy Talia's sound cloud. Um, and she has some some other really interesting pieces there, uh, just in case you want to check that out. We'll just wait for Deborah. Um, I think it's a collaboration uh, that was a co-creation uh, with um, some words she put together and some music with her husband. So we'll just wait one moment. That was the link to Wendy's, yeah. Yeah, that was. I was just. Uh, pop, I just popped that in the chat. Uh, while Great, you... so we can have a look at that. Yeah. The party's almost over. A red-haired girl swirls a dervish dance, alone in her own wild world, while phantom lovers smile sweetly on. Dernière commande de la nuit. La fête est presque finie. Une fille en cheveux rouges tourbillonne comme un dervish en folie. De la nuit, la fête est presque finie. Seule dans son monde sauvage, et les fantômes de ses amants qui sourient. Last orders, please. The night is almost through. A coaxed in ex guitarist of an almost famous band. Seek solace and southern comfort to memories of backstage glory. Dernière commande de la nuit, la fête est presque finie. Pour ce guitariste trop poudré, héros d'un groupe presque oublié. Dernière commande de la nuit, la fête est presque finie. Pour réconfort En mémoire d'une illusoire gloire Last orders please One more for the road Then back to mine Then back to mine Then back to mine Then back to mine Then back to
Brilliant. Oh, thank you. We got it working at the end. Ah, yeah. Um, maybe needs a little bit of context. Um, it's not it's not an ed tech theme. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a little um autobiographical. It's an insight into my life. Um, collaborations with my husband, who is the musician and the singer who put this on his album. Um, and the way we we did a kind of mashup. Um, starting from this poem that I'd written, which in itself is autobiographical. I did it in English. Um, and uh, then we, he decided to put it into music and uh, felt that he needed to sing it, but couldn't sing it in English. So he translated it and did this adaptation in French. So it's, it's like a conversation. Um, I do the spoken word and then he sings it. Um, I, think, I think the lyrics are actually on that page, um, the English lyrics. Uh, maybe the French as well. And um, really, it's also, if we could look back oh, at, yes. at lockdown, um, when we were doing this kind of thing, um, the support, I was doing my PhD at the time, and this was a way of getting through that period and having somebody um, that I could just be and create with, who happens to be my husband as well. And that really got us through. And at the end of the day, I'd finish off working on my PhD. He'd come out of his studio. We'd put songs like this on and we'd be dancing in the living room during lockdown. So um, there you go. Those are a few insights into that. That's brilliant. Um, I love it. Uh, I really like the... It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, in fact. Oh, and the one last thing is feeling mutually, respectively proud of each other for the work that we were doing during that time. And I think that's really, really important to highlight. Nice one. Yeah. Um, if you want to collaborate, we could write some songs together. I'd love to join your band. <laughs> um, great. Um, let's unpack the open mic as a methodology. Um, so learning technology has learning and it has technology. And as learning technologists, we're passionate, I guess, about both of those things. And even if we're not learning technology, we go on learning technology. Um, to improve the learning experience. And I just wondered um, if we could have a, a quick discussion before Lee um, yeah, headline act about about the open mic. Let's interrogate the open mic as a methodology, as a, an approach to, approach to pedagogy. So earlier I said that maybe the open mic is inclusive, it's an accessible approach, it's um, transferable, it's outlawed. It's, it can take place online or offline. You know, uh, it's collaborative. Everyone has a voice, everyone has a seat at the physical table. Um, and I just wondered if we could maybe all unmute our mics and maybe have a bit of a discussion about how you perhaps would use the open mic approach in your own pedagogical context. How would you use it with students? How would you use it with staff? Is it something that you could adapt and uh, personalize? Um, is it something that can be um, differentiated to meet learning needs? Um, anyone got any sort of strong thoughts or anything you'd like to share? Um, well, as a participant uh, in this, I, I think what I like about this, and I, I think in general, non traditional formats for conferences is that, you know, uh, when you go to ALT and other uh, e-learning conferences, but especially ALT, um, there's a kind of a sense in which um, to be really legitimate, you need to do, you need to be an academic, you need to do something academic, you need to cite research, and you need to kind of sound academic and um which you know in a way ultimately undermines some of the things that alt should really be about and be questioning and when you uh do another format like this uh it 
sort of opens up a new set of criteria for success and, you know, new ways that it, I think it kind of allows different ways of talking and different kinds of people, different kinds of voices to, to express themselves. Um, and, uh, so I, I think it's, I, I always enjoy it. Um, uh, as much as I also, to be fair, I enjoy conference presentations too, but, um, when someone tries to do something in a, in any kind of other format, I, I think it can feel very refreshing. Thanks very much, Lenny. Um, um, is anyone in Manchester at the moment? Is anyone going to the conference? No, <laughs> unfortunately not. Online only for me. There was here something since we found Just like to add perhaps, um, about different ways of, of, of bringing in what we've been doing uh, this evening. Um, I think uh, all the, 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 the contributions that we've had to Romani's poem, um, Anna's poem, um, and um, uh, I, what was the one that you, that you shared as well from, um, who was that from? Let me go back to the program. From Wendy. Um, all of those, I think they should be on um, a, a learning technologist curriculum. You know, they should they should come up and they should be played and discussed as mm. part of it because they are um, uh, a ways of stimulating different ways of thinking rather than um, just the standard traditional way of, of going through learning design, uh, learning technology, and everything. And to get those those deeper discussions going. Um, and, and perhaps by, if people are willing to put those up as examples, um, and then to get engaged in the discussion, then that might encourage, um, more people to be brave enough to take that creative road as well. So, um, that was just my, my thinking when I was, when I was listening to, to the, the contributions that we've had so far today. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. I think you're right. Um, taking the creative path does require large doses of bravery um, and radical vulnerability. But um, um, it's fab. The creative route is fab. It, it just, um, you know, it really speaks to me and I really enjoy hearing other people's original work, particularly around learning technology. We've been experimenting with the idea of techno-poetics, um, combining technology and poetry. Announce you as... Nora. Right, so, uh, Dr. Lee is the Alt, uh, Alt C Open Mic Again, and, um, an experimental performance poet and a video poet. Um, he's also a senior lecturer, um, at the University of the Arts London. Um, Lee's been a very big part of my, um, journey into, um, the London poetry scene and, um, also exploring techno poetics in terms of Using Zoom as a platform for uh, creative contribution, and it's uh, with great pleasure that I welcome the, the headline act. I'll go ahead and stop sharing screenly. Mm, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Yeah. So thanks for that that introduction, Pip. I think it might be nice for us to um, just to share uh, first of all how me and Pip managed to get to know each other. It was by doing a Zoom open mic. Um, poetry um thing for write out loud um nearly two years ago and i was playing around with technology very similar to what you'll see today using the visuals and combine using the visual green screen um of zoom and combining that with poetry pip was also doing um well, she was speaking poetry but she wasn't just doing the poetry she had a, a visual aspect to what she was doing and um yeah we found such a real synergy in terms of our interests and our kind of I suppose more quir quirky approach to technology as well. So as, um, as Pitt mentioned, yeah, I work at the University of the Arts London and my role is supporting students. I work in, um, I'm a lecturer in academic support and a lot of that does include technology. So I find this, all of these 
different discussions really really interesting um so without further ado you're probably wondering why i've got a mcdonald's hat on uh, it's not because i'm an advocate of mcdonald's or you know i'm trying to be trendy my poem this afternoon um is um well it has it features mcdonald's in it and it is um yeah it certainly has a, an auto ethnographic approach um all of my uh, zoom performances that i've been doing for the last two years um have really tried to use this platform as a way of sharing personal details personal stories a kind of almost immersive storytelling prototype um and yeah from just doing it on these kind of open mics different um platforms I've now gone on to perform perform iterations of what you'll see tonight at festivals, including uh, the, the Prague Biennale. So, yeah, it just shows you what you can do on, you know, I think when, when we came into lockdown and the first lockdown in 2020, coming in this kind of space was almost seen like a substitute or a kind of secondary for the physical world. But for me, um, it's actually been the thing that's really transformed my practice. But then going into the back, back, or let's say back into the physical world was the first time that I performed poetry physically. And actually it was at Paper Tiger where I met certain people like Hannah. Um, it, it was just, it brought in a whole other different sort of set of dimensions of actually having people in front of you laughing and actually, you know, completely different than the kind of, uh, sort of, yeah, what happens online. So anyway, um, this is my performance. It's about 15 minutes. Um, and it's called Covert Operations, and I hope you will really enjoy it. I I I I I I I I I discover the same other while creeping. Discover the same other whilst under the cover. Creeping, seeping, peeping, covert operations, my teenage fascinations. Awkward altercations with non queer populations, sensations that taught me if ever they caught me. I got very clever, very clever at seeing creep without being seen. seen. During a McDonald's stint, I perfected the art of the squint, escaping the gloom in the mail-changing room. It was late 94, the first time I saw this guy from the grammar school stripped at his jock. I thought it rude not to grasp what's under his pants. My eyes couldn't stop, my eyes were on lock. He had that grammar school voice my co-workers despise. So given worst job in the kitchen, he was stationed on fries. Every chance I'd be skipping, the onward of flipping, yet it allowed me some spying at grammar guy throwing. Getting sweaty whilst cooking, I couldn't stop looking at grammar school guy through the flames of my griddle. Just imagine a burger with his meat in the middle. Creep. Half announcement. Yes, you will go to the freezer and get more burgers. I could easily reach them, but ask grammar school guy. Hey, hello, those burgers in the freezer, they're up ever so high. I need some assistance. Do you mind come with me out back? I need a tall guy like you to reach up high for a stack. When he said yeah and put his apron back on the rack, my mind started seeing his sexy six pack. 
down towards the waste bins, past where they dump all the fat. Is the stock room to escape in and have a quick nap. It's where my friend who works on shakes, we call him McFlurry's Matt, caught the manager and the cleaner right in the act. Now alone in the chill room with the frozen burgers and fat, grammar school guy was shivering in his McDonald's cap, almost as sexy as seeing him stripped down to Jock's trap. When he reached over a barrel of plastic bubble wrap, I wanted to give his bubble bottom a slap. As the Irish say, he's got mighty good crack. The hard on I got made my flies go snap. I had him all to myself, him eating out of my lap. Despite my great fly, I had grammar guy on tap. Then Ronald McDonald stopped me there in my track. There was his costume hanging up. Over there on a rack, I got out of my nerves to pluck up the courage and say, How about you putting it on and we do some role play? Aww. To my utter amazement, he started stripping right down. And in a couple of minutes, he was dressed up as the clown, trying to sound all American, speaking or yank. He said, I'll be Ronald McDonald, you be little boy. Then said, do you want me to size up your fries and give you some big boy treats? But then my eye caught the sight of hanging butchered meats. And all I could think of was murder, murder, seeing cows hanging up to be made into a burger. Baby calves being born, thinking they've got all the luck, grazing a day in green fields from sunset to sun up. Then with their brothers and sisters, patter, they made into a quarter. A quarter pound burger sold just for a buck. No, Mackendings, we're not loving it. Your ethics suck. You set great mother from baby before Chick takes its first clock. It's like saying, oh, I love Daffy and Donald as you tuck into duck. I'd have done it, you know, if my flesh hadn't got stuck. It felt rather calmer giving Ronald to McDonald's what starts with an F and rhymes with muck. Zach announcement, employee 2035, yes, you, employee 7984, yes, you, but I am posh idiot, you, school guy, report that immediately, four. And so I said, thanks. I'll see you back in the kitchen. I need to go for a plan. And I left with my thoughts and I think we'll leave it in that. Imagining him still in that Ronald McDonald's disguise, us now back in the kitchen, in that station on surprise. As I flip burgers with Megan, she calls herself Megan. She makes flip beef burgers whilst claiming she's vegan. I do it for the money, she says. I just grit my teeth. But Megan, that looks vegan you're eating. It's rather like beef. Summer, 1993, same train, the 8.05 Leighton, central line to Oxford Circus, where I alighted to do work experience in mind-crushingly boring office job. <laughs> Oh, 
the stretch between Leighton and Bank. He would always get on at Bank, and that's when a thing woke up to my senses. He always sat in the same suit, always eyes closed. I had him approximately 40 minutes before he would alight at Tottenham Court Road. But three minutes of him I fall of you without distraction as the train of busier of that St. Paul's. Where someone would always shout, Move down, please! And my view of him would be blocked by a slight supermeter or big thumbed builder, and then I would have to enjoy him that partial gaze. What if he opened his eyes and saw the reflection of my mobile phone camera screen in the window behind me where I was sitting opposite him, recording him undercover? I've never seen the colour of his eyes. In gay Polari slang, the colour of your eyes means the certain size of a certain part of a man's anatomy. So, in this sense, I could see, or rather speculate, through those beams, the colour of his eyes. Tottenham Court Road, the balloon pops. I feel let down that I've had my daily fix as the train proceeds towards Oxford Circus. I under the cover, discover the same other whilst under the cover. You're matched. Say hello. 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 You're matched. You're matched. Say hello. You're matched. Say hello. Growing up, the gay scene, I got very clever, clever at not being seen, thinking covert operations were all on me, but I soon learned quite the opposite the summer of 93, doing work experience at BJ Cells, despite the job's boredom, I've got a scrapbook of tales. You are matched. I like. You are matched. I You are matched. I like. You are matched. 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 You are I shared my desk with Bobby, always sat at his computer, all day browsing Gaza to find his next smell suitor. Bobby's own idea of the word satisfaction was how far he would go to get some action. From the time he clocked in to the time he would go, all I could hear over for our desk was you're matched say hello john contact customer services john customer services death announcement john report to the manager and then there was andrew a timid man 
who ate cold baked beans for his lunch every day straight out of a can. He had two kids and a wife that led a double life. He couldn't wait to work late, then come quarter to eight. He was out on his date with his muscular daddy at the King's Arms pub, where Andrew loved being daddy's little boy cub. Spending the hours before on the floor and his fantasies of daddy in pencil drawing, hoping that as he was doodling, the manager ignoring. Your match to fail. 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 I remember our manager, Major Katie, that Eaton, he liked to tell everyone he sells record cheese in Eaton, a straight lady seller doing things by the book, and if your sales fell short, he'd give a hell of a look. But Mr. DJ Bellingham Jones to you was not all it seems when I discovered he had been having his own covert dreams, walking into his office without a knock, me and Andrew were forced in utter shock. No way in the job set for anyone's body was Bellingham Jones getting satisfaction from sales and body. And I dare not share the stories I have about John. Use your imagination, you won't be far wrong. The message is here in how far Bobby knows that those covert operations there might under your nose. Hi, I. Hi, I. And that's the end. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, my LED glasses are displaying a message, which is commensurate visually with sharing the love. That was absolutely outstanding, multimodal, incredible. Do you want to give us some, um, um, yeah, just, um, give you some yeah, ideas. Incredible. Thanks. Um, yeah, I kind of fail to make, well, I normally do this as a kind of, um, introduction, but yeah, all of the images that you see, um, are from my personal archive as an artist, um, from over 25 years. So, yeah, so I basically trained in painting and fine art, um, yeah, wow, well, 25 years ago. Um, and yeah, I had quite a successful, well, yeah, pretty successful career actually as an artist. Um, but then I got into performance, uh, when I did my MA at the UCL at the State School of Fine Art in 2005. And, um, I kind of let the sort of painting and drawing and the fine art, fine art side go a little bit. But I love performance and I love the kind of, um, you know, interaction that you can have with the audience. And, um, in, yeah, so I kind of, my, my PhD, um, was exploring performance art and its relationship to pedagogy and thinking about, um, yeah, thinking about a pedagogy of discomfort and using discomfort or uncomfortable situations within pedagogy as creating critical thinking moments. Um, because I don't think that when we're learning, it's, you know, it's not always a, it's not always a, it can be an uncomfortable thing and that uncomfort or that discomfort can actually be, you can turn that into something very, um, you know, you have to kind of go to what I call a, a, a space of radical not knowing, which can be quite uncomfortable. Um, so when I met, Pip, when I met Pip, um, I just, um, had finished, um, well, I just published a book called Leap into Action, which was, um, and Karen will know this because my, Karen, the lovely Karen Harris, who's in the audience, is my colleague at UAR. Um, she, uh, it was a book about critical performance of pedagogies and yeah, looking at what I was saying earlier about, um, discomfort as a, or disruption as a critical thinking tool. Um, that was, it was basically in three sections of the book, disruption as a critical thinking tool. The second section was about, um, senses and affect and the body within teaching and the importance of haptic 
learning environments to create kind of inclusive spaces for, you know, because not all students are visually able, not all students are physically able, you know, we have to think about this. But the third section was called techno participation, which was all about, um, yeah, critical digital performative pedagogy. And then, of course, you know, what happens two months after the launch? It was launched in December of 2019, two or three months later. Well, we all know what happened, don't we? Um, and yeah, I just couldn't believe all the things I was talking about, disruption and participation and technology were like, oh, it was in the face, wasn't it? Particularly those of us that work, um, well, I'm not just going to say with students, on all aspects of education. Um, those kinds of concerns were like thrown right into the fore. It wasn't just a case of theorising about it. You had to well, do it and learn because, you know, the only way, to, well, in fact, most of my teaching, or in fact, all of my teaching in 20 and 2021 was online. And it's only been this year that I've managed to do some physical teaching, which has been, um, yeah, wonderful, but also kind of reminding myself or remembering the etiquette of being in a physical space. Um, so when I met Pip, which was um, just a few months, in fact, it was a little bit after that, it was about six months after, um, I started to make films um, because I'm sure for many of us, we didn't have the necessary resources that we, we could have in the physical world. So I looked back at my archive and I started to remix and recycle these paintings and drawings and the kind of the audio that you heard in, in the poetry performance tonight. Um, to make those into short films and I started to send them out to different people and the response was incredible they were in all these different film festivals and it was fantastic but I really missed performance so when I met Pippin I think it was January 2021 it's just after that Christmas and um, I did I, I started to combine the poetry and the um, I, so what you see is where, where it says add green screen video the films that I made in that period, uh, in 2020 and 2021. And actually there's new stuff. There's, it's not just the old stuff being recycled. Um, yeah, it's kind of a constant remediation all the time. Everything gets remediated and it's just, just feels wonderful to be looking at stuff that I was making 30 years ago. Like, for example, at the end, we're in the office and all of those pictures of the people sitting down at their computers. They were paintings that I made when I was in my early twenties. So that's like, you know, mid nineties and sort of really to reimagine what those meanings could be then, but what happens now. So yeah, it's been an incredibly, um, because of forcing us to, um, yeah, kind of forcing us to be in a space of, um, developing methodology. I think methodological survival tactics, to be honest. And what do you do when your, I suppose we've, we've been forced to almost be like bricolors, and I love that term bricolage because it means forcing yourself to use what's at hand. And so that's what I do. What's at hand to me? I suppose it's the materials that I've I've already produced and I've recycled them, but it's also about the content as well. So I've never made work until I mean two or three years ago um, when I started writing poetry. None of my work was explicitly about my identity or myself. It wasn't an autoethnography. I was very interested in writing about the other and the other people um, and working with different kinds of communities, but never about the queer community and certainly not um, about myself. So, for example, there's quite a lot of very personal details in what you brought tonight, but it's also a space of fiction as well. And I'll let you use your imagination about which ones are slightly fictionalised. And but yeah, most of all of all of those um, experiences that you heard tonight were based in fact. So I want to say, I think it's a brilliant idea that, that Pip is trying to take this kind of um, format of the open mic, which, um, yeah, just sort of going back to that question we had earlier was about what, what are some of the possibilities and potentials of it. Um, for me, um, the open mic, I suppose when I first started doing it, was something that would be quite playful and quite casual and try it out and be experimental and be like a laboratory, which it still is. But then because I can't do what I do, what you've seen tonight in the other world, in the physical world so easily. Um, and so I love these Zoom open mics because I can really take advantage of them. And I, I treat them not just as these casual spaces, but as spaces of real um, heightened creativity for me. And it's been, yeah, it's just amazing to think how they've transformed from being these little kind of um, 
yeah, two or three minute things. So now, I mean, what you saw tonight was only a section of a much longer performance, which is almost an hour. So <laughs> you can imagine how I feel after that. So, Pip, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, if anyone's got any questions, like to keep in touch, please do. I'll put my details into the chat. But um, yeah, um, actually, 15th of September, I think it's at half eight EST time. I'm doing a live stream performance for uh, Prague Biennale, which will be similar to what you saw tonight. But um, yeah, have a look at that. That should be good. Right. <laughs> That's enough. Well, thank and, you. Yeah, my, glass, my glasses are still working. So basically, the problem we had was that the on and like literally 10 minutes before I was due to go on, the on and off button died, but we've managed to switch them on, but we can't, we, we won't be able to turn them off. So they're going to be on all the time now. Um, but I quite liked it in the performance where I think they, they started to come off me or slide off. But it's quite interesting the moments when, when that happened because it actually related to what I was talking about. So, yeah, so sometimes rubbish technology can actually be to your advantage. <laughs> Not rubbish, but just, yeah, the, the kind of um, the lo-fi and the DIY you can use to, uh, for, for uh, theatrical effect. You can customise the oh, yeah. message and um, if you download the app, I think it links via Bluetooth. Um, so um, I think you can add text and um, a variety of uh, customised content onto the LED uh, sunglasses. So, um, They're very cool, but like I say, yeah. I won't be able to turn it off, so they'll have to be on all the time because the odd enough buttons died. So I think that's quite funny, actually. <laughs> and oh, I can't change the settings, so it's only going to be on that. Keep them on, they're great. <laughs> this person doesn't have LED glasses. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to everybody. Uh, who turned up for taking part, uh, performing, supporting, taking part in a critical discussion. This was the first ever Alt-C open mic experiment. Um, I like the word experiment because we, we can explore possibilities. Um, and um, so thank you very much for that. Um, feel free to tweet about your experience on the hashtag again is just Alt-C um, and I think for this year it's Alt-C Hashtag Alt C uh, 22. Um, thank you very much for being brave enough, as Deborah said, uh, to share your creative work. I absolutely love the opportunity uh, to hear and um, people's original work. Um, if anyone's interested in exploring the idea of techno poetics or techno to ethnography, um, feel free to get in touch. Um, the rest of the conference is happening in a hybrid capacity um, this week um, in Manchester and online. Um, they also do other conferences as well. They do an open learning conference, exploring open resources, and there is a winter, um, an online winter conference as well. Uh, please be sure to check out the ALT radio show live on the Thursday night show this Thursday from 6. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Lee Campbell for um, that multimodal performance. It's one of my favourite um, um, parts of that I've seen before, and it's one of my favourites. I love the, the robot voice and the um, the elements of autoethnography and the way he weaves it together and uses the green screen in such a creative way. It's just so... Uh, Deborah did ask in the chat about how do I do it, and I just wanted to say, Deborah, I would love to say that it's like really complex, but it's not. When you go on Zoom, um, there's, if you go to where it says preferences, um, and it says backgrounds and filters, if you click on that, it's got, um, a tab called virtual backgrounds and you click on that and it says add video. And so all you do is add basically a video. And so, I mean, mo like you've seen people have that or that. Um, and I thought, right, well, I don't want to look at that. So I thought, what would happen if I put in that? Uh, and of course, something magical happens. And, um, yeah, for something so sort of erudite, um, and something, I think also because it's a, you know, it can be Zoom technology in terms of communication can be so deadening. I love the fact that I've managed to find something slightly creative within it. But there we are. Um, 
yeah it, it's not it's not sophisticated at all but i quite love the fact that it's not sophisticated and anyone can do it brilliant so i hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and um maybe we'll meet again in the zoom universe in the not too near distant future thanks everybody Bye for now. Uh, thank you, Pip, for putting this all uh, together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Uh, let's go and uh, put the kettle on and have a nice cup of tea. Of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.